Welcome to the Meaningful Work Matters podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Soren, founder of Eudaimonic by Design. On this podcast, we'll dive into the world of meaningful work, explore its complexities, and examine its impact on people and the organizations they're a part of. Each episode features insightful conversations with cutting edge experts who are successfully navigating the challenges of meaningful work. We hope to offer you ideas, frameworks, and tools to unlock potential and design work that's fulfilling, impactful, and supports everyone's well-being. Subscribe or follow us now and let's make meaningful work matter. Welcome, Sarah Steffens. It is such a pleasure to be able to have you on the podcast today. Um, I am excited to be able to dive into a whole bunch of different topics with you related to topics like employee activism and and and, uh, and unions specifically and, uh, and their relationship to meaningful work. But before we do, maybe you can just give listeners um, a brief uh, a brief hello and tell them a little bit about yourself. Thanks so much. And I'm delighted to be here today. Um, yeah, I'm a longtime unionist. Um, I have really built my life around empowering workers and making sure that we can have what we need to thrive, you know, not just as employees, but as human beings. I started out by organizing my own workplace. I worked as a newspaper journalist for many years, and that is a shocking and world-changing experience to find out what it's like to organize a workplace um, in the United States in, um, that was 2008, and um, went on to be a uh, uh, union organizer and rep, um, hold a lot of different roles in my home union, Communications Workers of America. And now I am the director of the Worker Power Coalition, and we fight for labor ro- law reform in the United States for workers in both the private and public sectors. It sounds like that is very meaningful work in and of itself. It is. I'm incredibly fortunate. Um, well, let's let's just dive right in. You know, in the context of all of the kinds of labor relations and union work that you do, what what does meaningful work have to do with any of it? So, in my mind, every job is meaningful. Every job is important. All work has dignity. I really don't believe there's any such thing as unskilled labor. But not every workplace treats workers as though their jobs are important and meaningful. You often, I've often encountered this disconnect where it's entirely possible. It's really even common for workers to care a lot about what they do, um, especially people who are in roles where they're helping people. They care a lot about their clients, patients, customers. And so they can find great meaning in what they're literally doing in society on a day to day basis. But they're not finding that that commitment is being matched with basic decency. They may not have a living wage. They may not have any paid sick time. They may not be treated with respect uh, either by their managers or or by customers or the public. They might not be protected from harassment. It's a complicated, you know, divide, but something I think that unions are always trying to sort of heal that gap. The meaning of our work and the commitment that we bring to our work should be matched by, you know, the conditions that we work in and the decency with which we're treated. There's a, a lot of work that's done um, within the research on meaningful work about the relationship between decency and meaning. And in fact, um, somebody else who we've had on this podcast, David Bloomstein, um, David talks about uh, in some ways a, a two by two. Like you can have, you can kind of plot a job based on how much meaning is there and how much decency. And um, and and depending on you know where you fit in that two by two, you're going to see very different things. Like you could have somebody who has a lot of meaning and a lot of decency in their work, and kind of have the dream job in many different contexts where you know they love what they do, they find it really important, 
and they get compensated really well for it. And they have a great deal of security and they have a great deal of freedom within that job and, um, and, and a lot of dignity at work. Then there's people who have, you know, a great deal of meaning and very low decency. Um, the classic example is often zookeepers who mm. like feel deeply passionate about their work, um, see it as a calling and yeah, are often exploited in, in some of the worst working conditions um, of comparable professions um, anywhere, anywhere around. Um, and then you can have people who have, you know, a tremendous amount of decency, a great corner office, get paid very well, but are fundamentally doing bullshit jobs, as David Graeber might say, where there's zero meaning whatsoever in um, in the work that they're doing, um, or people who have neither meaning or decency at work. I guess one question I have for you, like, should we even be talking about meaning if we don't have decency in place? I don't, I think it's important not to disregard that people still care about their work and they care about doing a good job even when they're not treated decently. Not universally, right? There comes a point <laughs> to which even the most um, loving, caring person will say, you know, that's it. If that's all they care about, these people that we're helping, you know, they're not getting 110 percent from me anymore. But, you know, when you were when you were talking about the, you know, the sort of the metric or the quadrants, I was thinking, you know, when you have a high level of decency, maybe the meeting you get is not on the job in your day to day tasks, but in what that can bring to your life, what it can provide for your children to have a really good job, what it means in terms of being able to have time off work to care for elderly parents, what you're able to achieve in the community. You know, there's a lot to be said for uh, work that just provides well for you. You can find meaning in other ways. But if you have all the meaning and none of the decency, then you're really struggling. You're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis when you're on the job. You might be struggling at home just to pay your bills, meet basic expenses. You could be struggling emotionally because things that happen at work affect us as people too, right? On a on a personal and emotional level. I think the decency piece has to be in place. Like people just have to be able to feel respected, able to have a voice on the job, able to have a living wage. Nobody should be working full time and relying on government assistance. You know, we're not you know, in that case, the subsidy is really going to the employer, right? Not the individual. Um, and then once that piece is in place, I think it is important to talk about meaning um, and also to talk about the ways that meaning, the meaningfulness or or the sense of purpose or dedication to their work that people have can be exploited or turned against them. Let's talk about that. There's definitely dark sides of meaning um, within the literature. Um, lots of good things, like lots of good things um, in the literature about, about the role that meaning plays, um, both as individuals um, and for our organizations. Like we know that when people are engaged in meaningful work, um, typically they're more committed to the work that they're doing, that they perform often better, um, they're more pro-social at work, they're better corporate citizens, um, they they have uh, less intentions to leave their organization, they're, they're potentially, um, they're, they're, there's less absenteeism um, uh, on the job. Um, that people are more creative, you know, there are all sorts of like really good things that make a lot of people like me as organizational consultants really interested in boosting the level of meaning um, at work. But we also know that there's this dark side. So take those zookeepers as um, as the classic example. You know, if I feel like there's a really high moral stake in my work, often what can happen is that um, is that I become obsessively passionate about the work so much so that the boundaries between work and life kind of disappear. And often organizations um, in the literature. Uh, actually ask more of people who are doing meaningful work. The, the levels of decency actually drop in an in interesting kind of in unfortunate correlation. You know, the more meaningful the job in some ways, often the less decency there actually is on the job. And all of that turns into negative affect and lower life satisfaction and career regret and stress and burnout and a pretty negative cycle. Have you seen things like that in organizations that you've um, you've supported? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of unionized workers that formed unions, especially because of that situation that you're talking about. You know, people have, 
I've heard it said before, the easiest way to exploit someone is to convince them that they're doing something that they love. (laughs) Or maybe they came to it with that love in the first place. And that always resonated with me, um, having spent so many years working as a newspaper journalist. I, I loved it. It was my calling. I was passionate about every story that I did. But, you know, work doesn't love you back. Right. So you see it a lot in um, nonprofit spaces and in certain, you know, for profit industries where you have these workers who care so much about what they're doing. And it just isn't matched by, I guess, an organizational commitment to sort of that core level of decency that we've been talking about. So in in the News Guild, right, which is my home union, which represents um, newspaper journalists and actually a lot of nonprofit workers, too. You have all of these members who care so deeply about their work and they see journalism as their calling and it's their contribution to the world. And they are deeply aware of the potential impact of their work and they take a lot of personal responsibility. So even if you're underpaid, (laughs) even if you really like overwork, there's a lot of understaffing, you're really overwhelmed. These reporters are going to go the extra mile to make sure that they You know, when the story comes out in the newspaper the next day, it's everything's right. It's as good as it can be. The people who are in the story, you know, see that their truth has been told. And so, you know, this cycle just repeats like at a daily newspaper every single day. And so when I started working on the uh, newspaper union end of things, I used to joke about how impossible it was to get journalists to uh, what we call work to rule, right? Just doing exactly what's required of their job and not doing that extra 20 or 30 percent because it you know the next morning in the end it's that reporter's name on the article right and it makes it very hard to sort of balance things out between the amount of work that you're being paid or compensated for you know how much commitment or passion you really should be putting in and and that internal drive that you have and I think the other factor that comes into play there is the shifting over time or over decades of what some of these professions are. So there was a time that a newspaper reporter, you know, it was the this was the deal. They would throw themselves wholeheartedly into their work. And in exchange, they could have a good middle class life. They could buy a house, afford a car, get married, have kids, send them to college, retire with dignity. And that, unfortunately, in too many places is not the world that we're living in anymore. So you have these hedge funds and private equity firms. You know, they don't care about any of that uh, mission-driven passion or commitment to the cause, or they only care about it to the extent of, hey, we don't have to pay nearly as much as we would pay other professionals to do kind of comparable work because people love and care about this work so much. So now we see journalists who uh, rely on food banks, who qualify for subsidized housing. It's this kind of crazy situation. And then in a not unrelated development, a huge upsurge in union organizing in the media world. So the New Guild has grown by a third over the last couple of years. And you see a lot of organizing also, um, you know, in nonprofits and in the social justice sector, I think for similar reasons. People understand, you know, work, in the end, work won't love me back and it doesn't have to be this way. Do you see organizations concretely taking advantage of people's meaning? Yeah, I, yeah, (laughs) I think so. The extent to which that's conscious, I'm not sure. You know, you might hear people say things like, well, we're all, you know, volunteers here to some extent. It's also a job, right? There is a difference between things that we volunteer to do wholly out of the goodness of our hearts and things that we do for our work and our livelihood. Again, as as somebody going into organizations and often offering well-being programs or resilience programs to help people buffer and bolster their well-being in contexts where they are burning out or feeling incredibly stressed out. I know that there are some unions who are incredibly skeptical about those kinds of efforts because um, they uh, they might think that you're just, you know, ignoring the systemic realities and trying to in some way blame or gaslight the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, is that is that something that you've kind of seen or uh, or or have a perspective on? Right. I think where those kind of 
well-being initiatives are successful is where there's basic decency in place where, you know, workers are being listened to and treated with dignity. And so then it becomes an extension of, you know, the employer is saying, we care about you as a person, and they're demonstrating that in all kinds of ways. But when that's not the case in the workplace, then it just underscores, you know, that that disconnect. It's like the the pizza party when you're horribly understaffed and everybody's, you know, at wit's end. And it's like, well, thanks for the pizza, but it's almost more of an insult than a than a help, right? Like all the pizza slices in the world don't make up for it if you're working in a toxic environment, if you're not able to pay for your bills, or if you had to, you know, miss a, an important event that your kid was maybe in something at school that you wanted to be at and you're being assigned to do mandatory overtime for the fourth or fifth day in a row, which is, you know, something that happens to a lot of people. So is the pizza better than no pizza? I mean, sometimes it's worse, right? (laughs) Sometimes it would be better not to have the pizza and to just have the acknowledgement of, you know, what a bad situation it is. And in the end, of course, to have the ch- the change, the structural change that needs to happen to really, truly support people. And then there can be a piece of it. And the worst case is, you know, you mentioned sort of, it can be sort of like gaslighting or blaming the employee. When we were organizing my workplace, they had a meeting to tell us all how the uh, health care costs were going up a lot and we'd be paying a lot more out of pocket. The statement was a lot of these cost drives are um, the a lot of what's driving these costs uh, and these increases are personal choices that employees are make are making. So think about that when you order that hamburger at lunch today. And it's just infuriating to have somebody blame you for you know the American healthcare system and its. <laughs> It's, you know, out of control cost overreaches. And I think in that kind of environment, if somebody would have wanted to start a healthy eating program or switch out the options in the cafeteria, it would have been read, you know, as a further poke, uh, you know, a stick in the eye of like, you're not you're not giving us what I need. You're not acknowledging that there are forces here beyond our control. And in fact, you're you're blaming us and saying if we were more centered or if more of us were vegetarians or if we did you know, X, Y, Z, that things would be better. You know, that said, when I was at the union, I began a meditation program that was available to people for free to drop in. I thought it was great. The people that dropped in really appreciated it. Many people were not part of it. And that's okay, too, right? I think it very much has to be presented of this is an option. It's here for you if it's helpful. It's not expected of you. It's a tool. It can feel uh, going into certain spaces like the work that we are being asked to do is a band aid mm-hmm. um, that isn't actually solving the real fundamental structural issues um, that are that are at work. Um, and I think mindfulness. I mean, there's this wonderful article that came out in the Guardian on the mindfulness conspiracy several years ago that um, that talks about you know just this huge. Um, at an industry, multi-billion dollar industry now that um, that revolves around getting organizations to sign up for mindfulness apps and programs and things like that as the solution to helping people. Um, you know, if if you feel like you're in a situation that is um, too much for what you can handle, um, you know, a solution to that is uh, is to think about how do you become more mindful? How do you ultimately take um, how do you how how do you how do you embrace a meditative stance to be able to deal with your own kind of um, uh, uh, you know emotional response to that situation as opposed to saying hey there's maybe a reason why you're feeling those things in the first place and yes of course we should have personal resources to be able to deal with um, with all of that but we should also have the enabling conditions so that we don't have to deal with that. And it's not really an either or situation. It has to be a both and situation. Right. You know, sometimes what you really need is paid time off, (laughs) you know, take a a bit of a break and be able to have that reset by spending time, you know, with family or people you love or going on vacation or 
walking in nature or focusing on what it is that's, you know, dividing your your mind, you know, your your ability to feel present at work. And so where people have that opportunity, if mindfulness or other well-being measures are sort of an additional option or a way to sort of be a fuller human being, have a happier, healthier life, and that's something the employer is offering, that could be great. It's just there's so many, I guess there's so many places that it doesn't start with the workers themselves, right? If the workers themselves had a, uh, well, a union, but barring, you know, where that isn't in place, a well-being committee and said, here are some of the things that we would like that would be helpful to us, I'm sure it would be better received. How do you think that the pandemic has impacted um, the ways that both employees and employers have, have thought about well-being? Yeah, so on this really basic level, I think the pandemic was a clarifying moment for a lot of workers. The workers who were being sent into unsafe situations day after day, sometimes without any sort of, you know, masks or protective equipment or real safety measures in place. And they came to realize, wow, I really am just dollars and cents to this company that I work for. Like, they literally do not care if I die. You can't unsee that once you've seen it, right? Those workers that were in those situations will never go back to feeling the same way that they did before the pandemic. Having lived through that I think it fundamentally changes people. And I also think that you can't tell somebody that they're essential, that their work is essential, their job is essential over and over again and not and then turn around and say, well, but we didn't mean (laughs) but we didn't mean we were going to, you know, pay you fairly or continue to protect you or treat you with dignity. You know, I think a lot about if you can remember back to the time when we were all, you know, uh, people would go out and beg, bang pots and pans or light candles for healthcare workers, right? It was a powerful showing of, you know, how much society needs and appreciates healthcare workers. But then that has to be matched by a commitment by by employers, by our society as a whole to support healthcare workers. You know, you've seen successful strikes, right, with a lot of healthcare workers going out and saying, okay, now now that we know how essential that we are, healthcare workers have always known that, but to really feel that from society and also what they sacrificed and went through, you know, should be recognized and compensated. Or we were, a lot of people were hanging signs in front of their homes, thanking delivery drivers, right? Now you saw the Teamsters get a record contract for those delivery drivers because they were united. They understood our work is important. Um, Society can't operate without us. And so we're not going back to that time when people would say that this is, you know, somehow a job that's less deserving than other kinds of work. You see those those gains um, sustaining um, as we get further and further away from the lockdown period and the essential work period. I do because I think that what people are willing to put up with for money has fundamentally shifted. Like mm. somehow a, a a a door was opened or a window was opened, like things just changed. And so I don't see people being willing to go back to, you know, some of those systems that really treat workers like they're disposable, like just in time scheduling where you're constantly you know, on on call and, and your schedule might change at any given time, but you're always expected to be available for work. You know, if they're so essential, why would we operate that way? Um, understaffing, you know, some of these working conditions. So I, I'm not sure how it'll play out in the long run, but I, I do know that we've seen a handful of employers try to sort of flip the switch and say, okay, the pandemic's over, everybody back in the office, or we're going to go back to doing everything the way we used to before we had remote or hybrid work or some of these other things that developed. And it hasn't gone well for them. People are not willing to go back to the way that things were. Mm -hmm. Workers are different. 
workers are more willing to flex their power than any time I've seen in generations. People are understanding, especially in this economy, that the ability to withhold our labor is really powerful. And so you see that example happening over and over again. I think young workers understand this to a particular extent, so that to the extent that that persists, this will be a shift that's growing, not a shift that's dying out. And then the last thing I think about a lot that I think will not go back to the way that it was is the acknowledgement that people have, you know, families, personal lives, things going on outside of work. So those of us that worked remotely during the pandemic, we literally saw people's cats climbing across the keyboard, people's kids coming and, you know, cozying up and waving hello. So when I was a new mom and I had to sometimes work at home you know, with a kid in the house, I would be so, I remember just being so, you know, embarrassed, actually, if my kid was crying or somebody, you know, had the sense that I had this unprofessional, you know, dog barking child interrupting me kind of thing. And now I look at it and think, why did I ever feel that way? And I think we've had, you know, everybody, so many of us have had that experience now of saying, We're actually, you know, people who have other people in our households. And why did we sort of pretend that we needed to be these professional people that didn't have outside lives? Those two things can coexist. They don't have to be in conflict. And to the extent that we are acknowledging that people have kids or other things going on in their life and saying, we're going to find ways to accommodate that and still get your work done, it's actually better for every, everyone. There was, it was never good to pretend that we, you know, didn't have kids and parents and, you know, people, it, doctor's appointments, things that we needed to do just as human beings, not as, you know, employees of a corporation. As I hear you talk about the impact of being able to see people's actual lives um, and the reality is that they are full human beings and not just resources in an organizational context. Um, it shifts, I mm-hmm. think, people's perceptions. Yeah, I've sometimes thought that a huge part of my role in the labor movement is to just be the one that's saying, you know, we're we're also people. <laughs> you know, we're people with bodies that get sick. Or, you know, sometimes we might have babies. We <laughs> we have things that we need to do. We have things that we care about outside of work. And that's not bad. That doesn't make us less good employees or less good human beings. It's just part of being human. Like, let's be human first and workers second. When it comes to creating the necessary conditions for moving forward, what do you think is the role of policy and government? So a lot of it would be around the decency and dignity pieces. So one big role of government is to set standards that our capitalist system won't. (laughs) So in the past, that's been, you know, safety in the workplace, like nobody should be horribly injured or die on the job, especially where those things are wholly preventable. Limiting child labor, which ironically is something that we're revisiting in the U.S., which is I don't even know what to say about that, but establishing a living wage, um, ideally under the one fair wage model so that you don't have this tipping wage that leaves workers really vulnerable to being harassed um, and mistreated because they need those tips from the customers in order to just break even. One of my many jobs in my work history was working at Denny's and I was a hostess, but I knew all the servers knew exactly how much they had to be paid in tips to just break even that day for the cost of their childcare and the cost of their transportation and buying, you know, you have to buy a new pair of stockings if you're a waitress wearing a uniform with a a skirt every day. And so um, tipping wage leaves people vulnerable and preventing harassment and discrimination in the workplace and making sure that those things are clearly illegal and that companies are making, you know, real and meaningful policies that keep that from happening. And then in the larger picture, to me, it's setting conditions where workers really can have a voice, a legal voice on the job to say what they think is important. So 
in the United States, that's uh, passing the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, the PRO Act, the Public Service Freedom to Negotiate Act, so which is for the public sector, so that workers just unequivocally have the right to organize, to form unions, to collectively bargain, to go on strike if they need to. Those are all really important tools that are unfortunately lacking. Making sure our tax dollars go to support decent work so that we're not just outsourcing everything to the lowest bid better, but that we're actually setting a standard. This is what decent work looks like. It's going to have pay and benefits and working standards that are sort of commensurate with the responsibility and the importance of the work. Those are all, I think, important roles for the government. Have you seen them? Um... Have you seen examples of, of countries or, or, or areas, even, even whether it's in the United States or, or much more broadly outside that are doing it really well? In general, the European relationships between employers and their labor unions are much better. <laughs> and it's just seen as an ordinary part of doing business that you would consult with workers in some sort of a formal way through uh, worker boards through sort of sectoral approaches. In the United States, there's such a knee jerk, strange aversion to any kind of unionization that, you know, it's it's kind of it's bizarre. I think it's come deliberately from a union busting industry that promotes that way of seeing the world but it is to the it's so severe that i think it's actually detrimental to business that employers are shooting themselves in the foot by saying they're going to keep the union out at all costs when they could just listen to their workers let them organize and some of these problems could be taken care of pretty quickly in that kind of an environment and i think you will find employers who've been through the process and on the other side of it will acknowledge like, yeah, it's actually a good thing that we have a union here. There's been some really interesting research, especially some new research that's coming in that looks at the role of activism for our psychological health and, uh, and well-being. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, being an employee activist can actually be a very meaningful thing. It can give people a lot of purpose. It can give people a sense of agency, um, a sense that they, they matter, that they're valued and valuable in certain contexts, especially when they don't necessarily feel that at work. Have, have, I mean, I'm guessing based on just your choices, your career choices, that you've probably felt that um, at times. Do you think that there's a positive case for employee activism for improving like, the well-being of the activist? A hundred times, yes, absolutely. I never felt so connected to my coworkers and so good about who I was as a a person, a worker, an employee, as I did when I was helping organize our union at my newspaper. Feeling powerless is terrible. Like you're just there's just an onslaught of things happening to you that you can't control. And so to make the choice to say, I believe this can be better. I believe that I can be part of making that happen. And I can work with my colleagues to do that together. It's just, it's a wonderfully healthy shift. I really felt like my coworkers became my family. I feel like I'm still very close to a lot of those people in a way that I hadn't been at previous workplaces. People who are employee activists together, whether it's from union organizing or something else that they do to try to con change conditions at their employer, they see each other differently. Like it's like you become a, a family and it feels really natural to me that workers, whatever they're initially organizing for, they begin to look for ways to help each other. So I've seen workers organize and then stand together to protect an employee who's a trans person and they're being forced to use their dead name that they don't use anymore on their security badge. Or they organize maybe around a workplace issue and then they really want to get involved in the climate justice movement and how does their employer's work impact that and how could their workplace be doing more. Or tech workers who want to make sure that their 
technology that they're, you know, helping to code or produce isn't being used in harmful ways in the global environment. So when you're able to do those kind of things, standing up for racial justice, LGBTQ rights, sort of global decency, it, of course it brings meaning to your work, right? You see yourself as more than just, you know, a cog in a big machine. You're somebody who's driving a positive change in the world. I'm curious about how, how many unions themselves advocate for their own workers' rights when it comes to well-being. Um, I, I would imagine that sometimes it's probably a little bit like the parable of the shoemaker's children wearing no shoes. Um, but are, are there like great examples of of what that actually looks like? How, how do how do people doing this work actually bolster and buffer the well-being of those who are, who are trying to do it? I wish I could tell you that unions are model employers. <laughs> I think anybody who's worked for a union knows that that's not always the case. Where it works, it's because we are really listening to workers, you know, living our values in that way, actually creating opportunities. Yes, you know, at the bargaining table during collective bargaining, but in workplaces where there's a really great environment between the unionized employees and and their supervisors, there are often lots of standing committees or sort of easy ways to make sure that the communication keeps flowing. In those kind of workplaces, stewards might have a great relationship with sort of frontline supervisors where they can work on keeping things from becoming a problem. So it's not that you have to always go through a real formal process to work everything out, but people see that they have, you know, a steward on the job who's their advocate on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, when it really works, it's rooted in respecting the dignity of people and that the idea that they're human beings. I've seen uh, unions and social justice workplaces, you know, go out of their way to tell people, hey, if you're deeply affected by this world event and you need to take some time off, let us know. We will be able to accommodate you in that. So acknowledging in that way that we do have this emotional connection to our to our work and the global community. What else should I have asked you about the topic of meaningful work that I haven't? Um... I just really wanted to underscore that idea that every job is valuable. Maybe not every worker experiences their work as meaningful. But when I look back at all the jobs I've had, you know, I I grew up in Minnesota, worked a lot of different low-wage jobs um, through high school and college, worked at Denny's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. And so I can't say that every, you know, was I treated with dignity in all of those places? No. But was the work meaningful? Yes, right? It, it might not have always been decent, but it all contributed to me becoming the person that I am. I helped people, whether it's, you know, food service where you're literally helping hungry people eat or you're a call center worker helping people um, get signed up for public benefits or make sure that their phone or internet is working properly. You're a delivery driver. There's all these jobs that we don't, that we have a tendency as a society to undervalue. But but it's all it's all meaningful. It's all important. And it all contributes to society and also to individuals and them understanding the world and the way that we're all connected to each other. Sarah, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for helping us grapple with the humanity of work, which is my giant takeaway from this conversation. Um, we have an ethical duty and responsibility to really think about the human beings. Um, not just the human resources that work at all of the organizations. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great conversation. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Meaningful Work Matters. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And if this episode resonated with you, please take a moment to leave us a review. Your feedback helps us make this podcast better and reach more listeners. 
You can connect with me, Andrew Soren, on LinkedIn or visit www.eubd.ca to learn more about eudaimonic by design. Finally, if what you heard today spoke to you, tell your colleagues and people in your community about our podcast. We really appreciate your support in making meaningful work matter. See you next time.